Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our training introduction to FE Safe. Um, we are just waiting a couple more minutes for more people to join us and then we can get started. So thank you for your patience. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started. Um, uh, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and the chat button as well. So if you guys have any questions, please enter it over there. Um, and we do have some people here in the office. So if you guys hear some conversations going on, please ignore that. Um, so let's get started. Uh, I would like to um, introduce Arindam Chakraborty, who is the Vice President of Advanced Engineering at Bias, and he's going to be talking to us for a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, thank you, Denise. I'll make it quick and short. So thank, thank you all for attending uh, this uh, uh, technical, I would say, seminar com training. So what we wanted to do here is uh, kind of talk about the FE7. We have the right experts uh, from the source systems to talk about that. So you, if you have any question about the software or, or a specific kind of application you are looking for, uh, we'll be more than happy to discuss about it. So the way I would like to contribute is also, I mean, I'm doing a lot of fatigue, uh, metal fatigue applications in oil and gas and other energy related industry. So maybe I can, I can talk about how we can use the FSA for your uh, problems that relates to the code and all. Uh, so anyways, uh, having said that, I'll give the floor to Ashwini and uh, I wish we all have an engaging conversation today. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Arindam. Uh, so, well, hello everyone. I am Ashwani Kumar Goel and I am working as a Sumulia Senior Solution Consultant at Desert uh, System Sumulia Corporation. I have been working for this company since last seven years. So... Uh, during these seven years, I have worked on many different applications and during my current role, like there are like three job responsibilities. One of them is doing support. So if you have any questions related to any of our product, then I'll be one of the several support engineers who will be taking your call or answering your support request. The second is the training. So I do training in a lot of different areas, like I do training in the area of fracture, fatigue, also linear dynamics and rubber and viscoelasticity, writing user subroutines. So there are a lot of area where I work on. And I also work on in like metal fatigue as well as uh, fatigue of elastomers as well as weld fatigue. Yeah, in addition to this, uh, the other responsibility is doing pre-sales in a lot of other areas which I have already mentioned. So uh, before we do this, uh, uh, what we will be discussing today mainly is an introduction to FSA. This is, a, this is just a motivation of why we have to do the fatigue analysis. We have a full two-day class which discusses about how to use FSA, 
and we will not be covering that whole two days content in this two hour lecture yeah but what we will be discussing right now is the motivation of doing the particular analysis okay so first question which usually comes is why we have to do fatigue analysis so we have to do fatigue analysis is because fatigue failures are expensive if we look at any component that component failing in the prototype phase can be much more expensive than in the design phase and also component failing in service can cause a launch delays warranty claims recalls as well as legal liability so it can be even more expensive so i think some of you might remember this comet year disaster which happened in 1950s and this disaster was due to the fatigue failure and due to this we have uh, there were three lost aircraft which had many lost lives in addition to this not only that there were lost of lives but it, it was also the brand equity and the euro lost the lead in the jet airline industry to the usa and it has taken around about 50 years to regain that brand equity with the launch of the airbus okay. so that's how devastating the uh, fatigue failure can be so we have seen what happened when, when you don't do the fatigue analysis let's see what happens if we do the fatigue analysis so this is the case study which has been done by jaguar land rover and jaguar land rover has used a fsf turbo light and they have incorporated fsf turbo light at a initial design validation process and because of this there were few conclusions which came out from this project and one of the conclusion was that they have identified a lower cost alternative material and they were able to identify that at a world uh, at a very early stage and because of this that uh, they have reduced the number of engine tests from five to one so now let us see what is basically the fatigue analysis process which we use it in fsc yeah so this is the typical fatigue analysis process which we use in which there is a designer designer will model whatever component he is modeling and then he will do a finite element analysis so he can use any of the major finite element code to do the finite element analysis and then based upon that there will be some outputs from the finite element analysis which will be input to fsc so depending upon what type of analysis you are interested in if you are interested in just a room temperature fatigue analysis then you will just need stresses if you are interested in high temperature fatigue analysis then you will need stresses and temperatures also uh, if you are interested in like in the uh, if you in the finite element analysis if you are using the elastic plastic material then you will be needing both stresses and strains so these will be the inputs to the fsc along with the this input the other input will be the material data in which fsc provides users with more than 350 to 400 material data which uh, contains both the strain life uh, fatigue properties as well as the stress life fatigue properties both of them will be used to uh, and uh, you can use any of these algorithms to calculate the uh, uh, fatigue life the third input which will be needing is the due design in which fsf just not rely on most severe loading but whole of the duty cycle which is coming directly from the experiments that whole duty cycle you can be you, know, you can use it in fsf so these will be the three inputs which will go into fsf and then fsf will use a biaxial strain life algorithm by default and it will calculate the fatigue life and the life will be calculated at each and every node in the model and the results will be exported 
in the same format as your finite element model uh, import. Like if it is in the 4db format, then the results will also be in the 4db format. And then based upon seeing the results, you can either redesign the component or you can send it to the sign off list. And these are some of the different finite element uh, model which we support, like all the major finite elements uh, software are available which we support. So now why uh, you might ask the question that why we need an intelligent fatigue analysis software like Episave to do the analysis. Why can't I just use, uh, uh, <coughs> why can't I just uh, do the physical test? Definitely, you can do the physical test, but it is very time consuming. Not only this, it can be very expensive. And also, it is impossible to account all the conditions which might come up with your, uh, with your analysis, right? So you can definitely, do the test but that test needs to be done at the last when you have tried to understood whole of the process and you have got the results then you in order to validate the results which came from the simulations you can do a fatigue testing on that particular component and see how the results are matching okay. uh, so if you Remember the Jaguar Land Rover case, which we have discussed before. Not only it has saved the experiments going from five to one, not only it has saved a 120,000 pounds to the customer, which is not a very uh, decent amount, but it also has uh, less fuel used, which means uh, reduced environmental impact and action. So now uh, you you can uh, you can agree like okay uh, testing is not the way to go but then why can't I just use a traditional stress based fatigue method so why can't I just go to my finite element model look at the location of the maximum stress for that look at what is the mean stress I am getting and based upon that mean stress. I can do a mean stress correction and then cap all that stress amplitude, I can calculate the fatigue mass. Yeah. So that's what other thing which you can do. This can also be done, but this method is unreliable method. You can easily miss the failure location. And one of the most uh, disadvantage with this method is that it can't cope up with the complex loading and structure. So if it is like a simple, fully relaxed loading or fully reverse loading, then you can handle that. But if you are having a variable amplitude loading, then it can be very difficult to handle such type of loading using this particular situation. Yeah, so these are some of the uh, case studies which has been done by our customers which can show that why we need an intelligent party software like this. So this is the example which has been done by Dana Corporation. And what they have uh, realized that the location of the maximum principal stress is can be different than the location of the shortest life. And the reason it is, it's because just a stress is another part, one part of the story, but how, what is the loading sequence and the mean stresses occur in the component is the another part of the story. So all these three gets combined together to calculate the shortest life. And that is not always possible when you use a SN method, but with the strain life method that all of these three components can go together. So we found this uh, study interesting and that's why they have presented it in our Episafe user group meeting. This is like an another case study which came from Hyundai Motor Company. And what uh, Hyundai uh, have done in this particular case is they have changed their loadings. And 
they wanted to see what will be the effect of these loadings in on their component like if we consider the first case in this particular case it is having a amplitude of 600 and it is having zero mean stress and based upon this you can see that the experiment showed that the failure will be at this particular location which will be close to the bolt holes and that's what FVSAFE has also provided the location close to the bolt. Now in the second loading, now the mean stress was not zero. There was some tensile mean stress and also we have increased the load amplitude in this case. And in this particular case, again, if we look at the location, the location was same, but life has reduced because the load amplitude has reduced as well as there was a mean stress, but the location, there was no impact. So now if they use the loading, which is something like this, in which there was a overload and in addition to the overload, there was this fatigue load. Yeah, and if we if they use this particular signal, then what do you think? Where what should be the location of the failure? So any idea? If I will be you, I'll be thinking <laughs> it will be the same location. But when I present this to our customers, then then they guess because they say like otherwise i will not show show this example in the presentation right and that is true so with everyone's surprise the location of the fatigue failure was at this particular location and fvsave also has provided that location and the reason why this happened is because if we look at this overload uh, loading then there were compressive stresses which got generated near to this bolt hole and there were tensile stresses which got generated here and when you applied this fatigue load then these compressive stresses became the mean stress on that fatigue load similarly those tensile stresses became the mean stress on those fatigue loads so tensile mean stress is can cause more failure than the compressing mean stress. And that's the reason that the location has shifted from this to this for the fatigue failure. And that's what FVSAFE has also provided. The another aspect is the taking into account the residual stresses. So this is an example of the oil pan, and this has been done by the Ford Motor Company. So in this, this is the example where residual stresses hasn't considered into account but this is where the residual stresses also has been considered and you can see when the residual stresses have been considered then there were a lot of different red spots which has occurred which was not there before and because of this the life has changed from 15 years which was there without residual stresses to six months which was there with residual stresses. So you can see how much different the life can be if you will not account the residual stresses. Okay. So, so we need an intelligent fatigue software because crack may not start from the point of the maximum FPS stress. Also, crack initiation site may depend upon this loading sequence and also manufacturing effects need to be taken into account. So FSAFE considers all of these three into account. Okay. So why we want users to trust FSAFE? Because our customers are trusting FSAFE and they are validating it. This is the example of Ford Motor Company. And in this, uh, as you might know that the weld can be can be very notorious in terms of when you want to calculate the fatigue life at the welds. But this particular example shows that the test results can be uh, variety results uh, can be very close to the test results. 
The another example is from the Schaeffler INC. So in this particular case, if you see there are, there is a contact which is happening here. And whenever there is a contact, FSAF internally, what it does, instead of taking a biaxial strain-like algorithm, it considers the triaxial strain-like algorithms, which can give you a life much better. So in that case, and this is the comparison of the results which we got. And the third example is from the Eaton Automotive, which is the example of the supercharger spring. And in the case of supercharger, there were a huge amount of residual stresses which needs to be considered. And uh, FSA can consider those residual stresses. And because of that, the life was uh, pretty close to that of the test results. And all these case studies have been presented in our FSA user group meeting, and these are the references for that. So FSA is accurate, and we believe that FSA will give you a accurate result. And the reason why we believe that it's because it has the most sophisticated technology which is inside FSA. So FSA uses a multi-axial strain life method. Also, if you are interested in stress life method, that method is also available for you. FSAF uses what we call it as a critical plane searching. So in our introduction to FSAF class, we cover into very good detail about how does that critical plane searching, uh, searching works. But as we include the, effect, the loading and that loading can be a non-proportional loading. So it is not necessary that the stresses will be in the direction of the maximum principal stresses where the fatigue failure will originate. So that's why we have to do a critical plane searching and we need to find what will be the orientation where the maximum failure will occur. And that's what this critical plane searching will do. We also have a load cycle building functionality and we will cover a little bit in detail in the coming slides related to the load cycle. And FSAF has a full database of strain life and stress life material for this. So these are some capabilities which are available in our standard version of FSAF. We have a strain life uh, properties as well as we have the stress life properties. Uh, we, are, we also have fatigue of welded joints using British standard method. We also uh, recently, like three years before, now you can all do a fatigue entirely in the frequency domain. So we have the facility of doing that. You can do a signal processing with FSF. <coughs> and we have a component for Simulia eyesight. So in addition, we have a 350 plus materials which are available with FSAF. All these materials which has been shipped with FSAF, these we have not tested, these are available from the literature. So our metallurgists have uh, basically compiled all these different materials and uh, put it in that whole material database so that it can be available to the customers. Yeah, and that is available with the standard FSA license. So, any questions still now? No? Okay, so, so the people who are online, uh, we can have a conversation like after the presentation, uh, after my part of the presentation is done. So, so in FSF, there can be also a different load histories, like there can be a single load history in which you are just applying a single load and you are uh, superposing it with some particular signal or you are doing a PSD type analysis. You can also use a superimposed load history in which at one time there are multiple loads which are acting at the components and you want to take those different loads, uh, multiply it with those corresponding signals and then add 
all of those signals together and calculate what will be how many repeats of those will be possible you can also use a sequence of FEA solutions which is available for either large deformation elastic or elastic plastic analysis or you can also work with a linear dynamic approach like you can use a modal dynamic or steady state dynamic or even implicit and explicit dynamics all these finite element analysis also is supported in FSA. so in FSA, if you see there is a wide applications which can be used to do a fatty analysis in FSA. so in next four or five slides we'll be basically discussing some of these uh, algorithms uh, some of the flowchart which we use it for these different uh, loading so one comes is the linear superposition process so in the case of linear superposition process we will just do a linear finite element analysis which means non-linear geometry will be off and material will be just uh, elastic modulus and fall insulation nothing more than that okay sure so this will be a linear finite element analysis yep so what you will be doing you will be applying the load and that load will typically will be the unit load because it is just a linear elastic and what you will be doing in FSA, then you will be basically applying the scale and your material properties will be elastic and poisonous ratio the output which you will be interested in basically is the stresses that will be one of the input to the fatigue solver also depending upon whether you want to use a strain life or stress life you will need either SN curve or you will need a strain life curve in addition to strain life curve for the strain life analysis you will need Young's modulus poisons ratio and K prime and N prime which is the cyclic material properties yeah so in uh, this and this along with the material and the loading history where this loading history is again the any loading history which you want to use which comes from directly from your experiments that can be used and based upon this uh, you can do a fatigue solver and can predict the life yeah so in FSA, this is how the window will look like you are taking the stress data set and you are applying the signal going from one to minus one which is your fully reverse loading or you can you are taking the stress data set scaling that stress data set by 1.4 and also applying the these different signals yeah one signal is coming from stress data set one another signal is coming from stress data set two and i think once we will give one example i think that should be clear and the example which I will be providing is the example of the wind turbine. Yeah. So in this particular case, for the wind turbine, there can be a different forces which can happen. The forces in X and Z direction, as well as moment in Z direction and moment in Y direction. And each of these can be multiplied with this signal. And this signal is the experimental test which has been performed and these signal was reported in all these four uh, different directions so what you can do is now you can set up your finite element model and in the finite element model you can have four different steps in the first step you can apply the force in the x direction as unity in the second step you can just apply force in the z direction as unity in the third step moment in the z direction as unity and in the full step moment in the y direction of it so these will be the four steps which will be coming from your finite element model and the output will be the stresses from all these different steps <coughs> so these will be the four different uh, unit loads which will be coming from your finite element analysis along with whatever bonding conditions you want to apply there and then the stresses which got generated by these force will get multiplied with its corresponding signal force with 
in the z will get multiplied it with its corresponding symbol and same with moment z and moment y axis and once you do this you can then superimpose because all these forces are acting at the same time so you are basically taking their effect and adding them together and that's what you can do it in episode so these are those four steps which came from your finite element model force in x the stress coming from force in the x direction stress is coming from force in the z direction stress is coming from moment in the z and moment in the y direction these are those four signals which are illustrated here force in x on z moment in z and moment in y and you are then just getting superimposing such that this stress data set 1 is getting multiplied with this signal stress data set 2 is getting multiplied with this signal and so on so forth in the same block so it means that all of them are superimposed okay. so this is like a first type of loading which the users can get right the second type of loading is the sequence of solutions in which in the previous uh workflow there was a linear finite element analysis which you are doing in the second workflow now you are doing a non linear finite element analysis so that non linear finite element analysis is such that your material properties are still linear but you are having a large deformation okay so in this case again you will be having a now your load will be coming from the load history which will be there in you in the finite elements now you will not be applying the load history on the particular solver but you will be applying the load history in your finite element analysis because you will be working with the large deformation problems and in the large deformation problem you cannot then scale right so that's why you will be working with that and but the material properties will still be elastic modulus and poisson ratio based upon this you will get a stress histories those stress histories will become your stress sequence along with the fatigue solver which will be you which you can use either stress life curve or strain life curve all these will get combined together in the fatigue solver and you will be getting a fatigue solver okay so this is one of the example which will come up for this particular case and in this case this is an example of the connecting rod and you want to see how much rotation of this connecting rod need it will make until you get light to crack initiation okay. so this is now not a linear problem this is a large deformation problem so what you can do you can run your finite element analysis and you can run it for one rotation but you can keep saving your results after every five days so that there are 72 increments which get saved into your odp and then once you have saved those results you can then directly use those in this elastic block and now your loading is coming from those stresses going from 1 to 72 so it's taking the inc stress increment coming from 1 to the 72nd increment and that represents whole rotation and now that becomes your loading and once you get a repeat that will be how many number of rotations will it be made until you get a that yeah so that is like an another class of problems which you can solve the third class of problem is when you have a global plasticity which is present in the model so in the previous two uh, processes you basically are doing the elastic solutions in finite element and then in episave we do a plasticity correction which we call it as a noibos but in the case of plastic plastic material processes the plasticity is coming directly from your finite element model so you are not doing the noibos rule in uh, episave so there is no plasticity correction which will be done in episave because a whole of the plasticity is coming from your finite element model so 
that is uh, in this you will be having a uh, you will be applying the load you will now be applying your material properties which will not be just a elastic material properties but you will be including your kinematic hardening material properties and based upon this now the output from the finite element will not be just stresses but it will be both stresses and strains that will be one of the input to the fatigue solver and then they have this this type of analysis is just supported with strain life curve it is not supported with the stress life curve because in the stress life curve we basically assume that there is not enough plasticity so that's why the stress life curve is mainly used for the high cycle fatigue problems not for a low cycle fatigue. so but these type of problems comes under low cycle fatigue so that's why we don't support this elastic plastic material processes for a stress life curve okay? and this along with the stresses and strains uh, will then be used in the fatigue solver to get you the the two previous methods were both linear. Yeah. Are the are, are the, is the strain life method available for those processes as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the previous two processes, it works for both stress life as well as strain. So the strains are calculated by if you say exactly, exactly. Strains are calculated by if you say from the stresses because it's just a Hooke's law. Yeah. If we know the elastic models, we can calculate the strains from that. So this is like an another class of problems which we can solve, which is we call it as a multiple block loading. So in this particular case, uh, like if you have an aircraft, right? And that aircraft is having taking off, cruising and landing. So these three can be come into three different blocks and each of these block can have apply the different sort of uh, loading on the landing gear yeah so so you can include all of these uh, into uh, in your in your analysis so like in this particular case this is an example of a uh, automotive in which there are eight different blocks and these eight different blocks can be one block can be just uh, going in on the highway the vehicle going on the highway second is going on the speed breaker third going on the county roads so each of them can have a different effect on the tires so that you can basically consider yeah so all of these can be different blocks loading and based upon this you can see like which of the block can give you is showing the maximum damage so it is and based upon this you can say or you can interpret like okay it is the vehicle moving on the rough road is giving more more damage compared to the vehicle going on the highways and so you can you can basically have such make such type of conclusion by using this particular plot so might be we have to just consider the vehicle moving on the rough road yeah, so this is what this plot will show you. So this is again another example from the wind turbine as uh, this area might be using some wind turbine examples. So that's why I wanted to show you this. So in this particular case, uh, it might be possible that 97% of the time, it is just a normal loading which is coming into picture, which is like a wind is very is normal but it is like a three percent of the time when you are having this maximum loading which is this particular signal yeah so this is just happening three percent of the time and this is having happening like 97 percent of the time so if you want to apply the loading for 100 days then this will have like 97 days and this will have three days of the load out of 100 so that's how you can put your uh, 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 create your loading in which you have created two blocks in this. In the first block, you have used the repeats of 97 for 
one particular set of the loading but for the another block you have used a uh, repeats as three for the another set of the loading with the another signal so these are the signals which is coming from the maximum loading and these are the signals which are coming from the loading which is your normal we can also do a vibration partition so uh, in which you can get a signal in the time domain we can convert the signal from the time domain to the frequency domain we can convert the power spectral density as well as cross spectral density for you and based upon that we can then calculate the fatigue life for you entirely in the frequency domain okay so that is like an another application which the users can use in addition to this these are the <coughs> these are the other advanced loading which we support we support the residual stresses as i mentioned before and also i have given you one example on the supercharger spring that we support the residual stresses we support the elastic plastic loading we uh, support the high frequency and low frequency superposition and one of the example will come in the later slides and also we cover the psd uh, based fatigue in addition to this we have a uh, three different add on modules one add on module is fatigue of welded joints which is used to study the fatigue uh, which is used to study the fatigue of welds and the product we call it as variety in fsa and my colleague murtaza will be explaining uh, something about variety in fsa uh, after i finish also fatigue of elastomers can be used to study the uh, rubber fatigue type problems and the product which we use is fsa rubber so all these three different products is basically an add on for the product so it doesn't come with fsa standard fsa license it is an add on module so we can we also supports it with eyesight and so you can take your uh, eyesight and in eyesight there is this fsf component and using this fsf component you can basically change your parameters you, you can change your geometry and based upon geometry you can basically see how much durability you are getting and you can also optimize that particular durability based on the parameters so you can directly control that you can trust fsa to give fast results so depending upon how many number of cpus you have on one node fsa will automatically take all the cpus uh, by running on the node and it will run the analysis as much as for uh, as quickly as possible so it always takes 7 tokens to run the analysis on one node whether you are running it on one cpu or you are running it on 32 cpus but the condition is all of them should have just one so this is like a different example one of the example is from the leading automotive over here this particular uh, problem has many different spot welds it has very complicated loading with 48 loading blocks and in each loading block there were like 24 superimposed load histories in each block and it has taken like 12 hours to run this particular model on 12 and if yeah so this is a very complicated <laughs> and still it takes like uh, 12 hours to finish it this is the example of the engine block from cummins and as you can see like going from one version to another uh we are determined to reduce the analysis time so we are in each version we are basically improving the time so now for the next 10 minutes or so we will be basically discussing two different workflows which uh, we have created for a oil and gas industry 
So one workflow is related to high pressure piping component uh, and durability. So in this particular uh, workflow, what we will be doing is we will be analyzing this uh, pipe and this pipe will be having two loads. One load which will be the uh, pressure from the gas which is exerting on the pipe, that will be one load. And the second load is that this high pressure pipe is sitting on this railway track and after certain amount of time, this train goes onto that track and it creates some sort of loading onto this pipe. So we want to take into effect that loading. So these are the two different loadings which will be considered in this particular example. And we want to we want to see the when and where it will fail. So this is the workflow which has been created. The first is doing the finite element analysis. So in this case, we, we didn't want to analyze whole of the pipe. So what we want to basically analyze is this component. And in addition to this, we have modeled these ones as just beam elements. Yeah, but this was the model which has been created very detailed. So this is how the model looks like. Yeah, with a lot of different contexts which are available here between different uh, components. The second is we will be using FSF to determine when and where the crack will initiate. So based upon whatever loading we are applying in your finite elements and in FSF, when the crack will initiate, that is one question we want to answer and where the crack will initiate. <coughs> so in this workflow, we also want to extend it further and we want to also know once we determined when and where the crack will initiate, can we also tell how much time it will take for pipe to rupture? So that will be your third step, which we will be doing in this one. Yeah. So usually, FSA provides you with just life to crack initiation. It doesn't provide you with the crack propagation and rupture. So that's why the propagation and rupture is done in Abacus using XFEM functionality but initiation has been done with FSF. So this is the description of our finite element model in which this is our pipe elbow section. This is where the beam elements were created and this is the symmetric conditions we are applying and this is a spot for the loading where the loading coming from the railway track is coming at this particular Point and that's what uh, is is the load. <coughs> so, in as I mentioned, there are two different type of loadings which are happening right now. One loading which is coming from the railway track, and there is another loading which is coming from the from the gas which is inside the pipe. Right. So, each will have its own time frame. So, like one of the example about these two different set of loading can be explained using this piston cylinder example, in which there will be a thermal cycle, which will be a very slow process. One cycle will take that much of time. Yeah? But there can also be a mechanical cycle, in which this cycle can happen very fast. So there will be a thermal cycle, which is a very slow process. And there's a mechanical cycle, which is a very fast process. You can superimpose both of, both of them together in FSA by using low and high superposition loading. And you can get a results which can be like this. So the same idea we have used in this particular example, in which there was, a, for, from the a gas, uh, gas pressure, there was this loading which was a very slow loading. And in addition to that loading, there was this high frequency block, which has been created on top of this elastic block, 
which was related to that high frequency, which was related to that train, which is going over and over and over onto the platform and creating the loads onto the, onto the pipe. And uh, this gas pressure loading is acting after every 60 seconds, but these trains are coming after every one second. So that's what this uh, high and uh, low superposition loading. So this is the loading which has been uh, then used in FSP. And what we have determined is where the crack will initiate it. And the crack will initiate at this particular point. And we also know when it will initiate. So it also has given us how much time it will take for the crack to initiate. So after we do this, now we want to answer that once the crack has initiated, how long does it take for the pipe to rupture? So what we then do, we know the location of the crack and also uh, based upon the location of the crack, we can create the crack tier. And then we can see like based upon the loading which we have defined, how much time it will take the crack to propagate and finally rupture. So this we have done using XFEM functionality along with the direct cyclic procedure. So in FSA, uh, sorry, in Abacus, we have a low cycle fatigue. Uh, we can do a low cycle fatigue uh, using a direct cyclic procedure. So we have used that to calculate how much time it will take for the pipe to rupture. Yeah, and this is basically how your crack will grow. So we have assumed some initial size of the crack based upon the paper. Uh, and then we have then seen that how much time that initial crack will take for crack to rupture the full pipe. Yeah. So this analysis is done in Arias. So the workflow highlights was that it took 12 years for crack to initiate and it took another three years for the crack to propagate and finally got subject. Yeah. So total the life was 15 years out of those 12 year, years was for the crack initiation. So this is like an another workflow, which is the fatigue analysis of an API thread using Abacus and FSS. So as you, you all are from oil and gas industry, so you might be knowing that this extended reach drilling as well as multilateral well, they have a threads uh, inbuilt there and there can be a failure of these particular threads. So because of the fatigue failure, it is basically uh, the researchers as well as the people from the company wants to know what is the fatigue life of these threads and how basically they can improve. Yeah. So that's why that's the major focus of this particular task. And so what you can do, this is the workflow in which you can create an axis metric model. And once you have created the axis metric model, you can use a Abacus half 3D model, and then you can do a FSA fatigue analysis. Yeah. So I will not go into too much of detail about this, but if you are interested, then please feel free to reach out to either Vias office or to me, and then uh, we can discuss it. So these were some of the outcomes which came from this particular workflow and that is fatigue analysis predictions using Abacus nonlinear results and FHA shows good agreement with the experimental results. So the values which we were getting from the this workflow was very close to that of the experimental results. Largest uncertainties in analysis came from the cyclic material constants 
also you need uh, to calibrate a non-linear kinematic hardening model and eyesight can be used for that particular purpose so again this is a very short illustration of the workflow if you are interested then reach out to us and we will get uh, you more detail about this particular workflow. yeah with this uh yeah, i will i would like to invite my uh, co-worker mutza who will be talking about fatigue of welded joints and after this we can open up with the uh, for the questions on any of these two and then I can also give you a brief demo on how does FSA looks like. Yeah, so. Thank you, Ashwini, and hello, everybody on the call. Um, as Ashwini mentioned, uh, uh, my name is Murtuza Abbas, and I'm a Simulia solution consultant based out of uh, Simulia's office in up in Dallas. So this is the office that, uh, uh, you know, can be referred to as the South Headquarters of Simulia, and this is where we uh, provide our services and take care of our customers in all most of the southern states in, in Northern America and Latin America and we you know work with uh, uh, wars like uh, like we are here so um, in my role uh, you know uh, I provide technical support consulting services and uh, uh, training to um, um, you know our users who use uh, Abacus, uh, FECF, eyesight, OSCAL 3D experience platform um, um, and I, I love to you know work with them on on, on their uh, uh, projects. So today, um, uh, Ashwini already covered uh, 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 you know a, a, a quick introduction of FECA. What I'll be talking about uh, will be um, I'll focus on uh, the add-on specialty module Verity, which looks at uh, the fatigue of welded uh, uh, welded joints. So let's see. So uh, when if in for for connections of a components where you have a weld you eventually when you when you are uh, thinking of fatigue you would most of the time be concerned with the fatigue of welded joints because of the residual stresses that get, get, get generated in the welds as uh, uh, they can be as as huge as uh, um, uh, the um, yield stress so in uh, verity um, uh, module in uh, FESAFE, uh, we provide uh, we have two essentially two methods to uh, perform fatigue analysis the first one is the conventional analysis of wells using the british standard uh, 547608 which came um, sometime after 5400 was launched uh, and this is uh, something that's included in FESAFE. uh what's, uh, what what comes with the add on module is uh, is uh, the new machine uh, load insensitive approach to analyzing wells uh, using Verity in you know, that is the ver Verity procedure that you know I'll, I'll give a brief overview of today. So this this new method that we'll focus on today in this talk is based on the equivalent structural stress uh, calculated from nodal forces, and we'll see how how is that better than some of the other uh, approaches that are uh, available out there. So one of the one of the well some of the issues uh, uh, that you know exist with some other methods that are available for the calculation of welded fatigues uh, are that you know if you look at your finite element model a simple example shown here for a T joint uh, we for for people who have experience with FEA and I'm assuming most of the people uh, attending do um, uh, you know you have an issue of stress singularity at sharp notches which come into picture when you have wells you know represented by that red dot uh, out there uh, that becomes an issue with your uh, 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 fatigue analysis the other issue uh, prime primary issue is uh, you know you have mesh sensitivity sensitivity in areas of uh, uh, stress singularity uh, um, that can uh, that would lead to um, you know your stress value being very mesh uh, uh, dependent or mesh sensitive so this this plot at the bottom shows you know as we uh, 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 refine the mesh make the mesh more and more refined for areas of stress singularity you will see your you know stress keeps on going up so there's a there's a strong dependency or sensitivity to uh, to uh, the mesh uh, in areas of such uh, sharp, where you might have sharp notches, which do come into picture when you have uh, 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 wells. And then, uh, you know, most of the codes and standards that are used for uh, the fatigue of uh, wells are based on nominal stresses or extrapolation based uh, hotspot stresses. And both of them um, generally struggle to give you accurate results. And we'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, some of the issues with, with, with uh, these two approaches that the codes and the standards uh, generally use. So on this slide, uh, you know, we are looking at uh, 
let me the uh, the hotspot uh, uh, stress method this is also one of the other method we do not offer the hotspot uh, uh, stress method in verity but if you look at that uh, uh, method you know it, it uses some extrapolation procedures and the, one of the issues uh, you know with with uh, with that is you know if you look at the extrapolation uh, procedure shown here for uh, a, a connection with a plate uh, 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 thickness of 15 uh, you know you need two points essentially because this is based on a normal stress method you you look at a at the stresses uh, at a certain distance away from the uh, uh, from the well and so in using this particular extrapolation uh, procedure you look at a distance of uh, uh, one times t t being the thickness and 4.4 times t to get two points and then extrapolate it to get uh, uh, the stress con uh, concentration factor. But one of the issues with this method, as you can see um, uh, uh, on this plot, is first, you know, you see a large scatter uh, based on what extrapolation um, uh, procedure you use when you're using the hotspot stress method. And the other is uh, the scatter also depends on the type of element being used. So we, for different types of elements, you, you see, you know, the ounce, there's not much consistency with the result that you, uh, that you obtain. If we look at the British standard method, which we do offer uh, in, in FECF, uh, and one of the primary reasons that we do offer the British standard method is because, you know, a lot of customers demand that. There are customers, there are users who uh, have been using the British standard method at work and they have their, you know, uh, uh, set up uh, 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 procedures of doing things and they, they would like to use FECF to use the British standard method. So that's the, that's the reason we have it in there. But you know, the, uh, some of the issues with the British standard method is that it, it has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you know, in not using the word guess, but a better word is it has a lot of subjective decisions. So you have to make decisions based on uh, the type of wealth. So when you, first of all, you need to have the British standard code, you need to know how to use that. And then, you know, there's a subjective uh, uh, decision when you look at based on the geometry of the well, you need to subjectively decide based on the uh, descriptions given what well class would that well fall in? So in this example that we see here, this well uh, you know falls in the class F2, and for that class F2, you have a particular uh, uh, SN curve using the nominal stress range again, and then that will give you the uh, the light. So for every different well class, you have a different uh, curve that needs to be used, and then uh, you know that that, that uh, so the, uh, again the subjective decision and the the requirement to look at different uh, uh, curve using the no nominal stress uh, uh, range method. So it adds a bit of, uh, uh, you know, subjective decision out there. And the second thing um, also is uh, that there is, a, 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 you know, a bit of guesswork, again, with the nominal stress portion of it, because we're not taking um, stresses at the well, uh, we are taking it at a distance away from the well, you know, with the assumption, with, with, with uh, well, not the assumption, the reason we take the normal stress approach is, uh, is because uh, the, uh, the stress uh, uh, singularity in the areas of the well are taken care of by the SN curve. So that, that's inbuilt there. So, you know, and the other issue with that is not all the wells in real life are as simple as the one shown here, and not all the wells that we see in real life will, will fit the exact well class, uh, you know, in, in the standard. So that, that are some of the issues uh, with uh, the other uh, you know, uh, procedures available out there. So, you know, then this question comes up that what really constitutes a good stress-based fatigue uh, uh, parameter? So what we would wish to have, uh, you know, after looking at the other procedures is that we would wish to have consistency in the calculation. So a good mesh insensitivity. So we looked at some plots uh, earlier um, and saw how uh, the results can be sensitive to the mesh and refining the mesh, especially in areas where you have uh, stress singularities will, will uh, you know, cause spikes essentially in your, in your stress. And the, uh, the other thing that we would wish to have is that effectiveness in the SN uh, uh, data co uh, correlation. So essentially, ideally, if, if what we would want to have is for different joint geometries, loading models and plate thicknesses, it would be great if we could have just one master curve as opposed to, you know, choosing different curves based on the well class that we have decided, again, based on a subjective decision. So that's something, you know, that we would ideally want. And we would also want to have robustness for practical applications. So it's, you know, uh, it's great to have something theoretically very advanced, but if you cannot really use it practically for your, for your applications, then, then that's essentially not useful for us. So, and, and these, the, you know, these criteria are what are met by the Verity method uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in FECF. So uh, FECF 
helps us, uh, you know, essentially delivers on, on all of these uh, demands uh, that are shown on the slide. So, so what is uh, Verity in EpiSafe? Uh, so Verity is a mesh insensitive. So we saw that, you know, mesh sensitivity was a big issue with some of the other methods that are available out there. So Verity is a mesh insensitive structural stress method that was developed by and patented by Battelle uh, Institute. So uh, SAFE Technology partnered with Battelle in 2005, uh, you know, to uh, make the uh, Verity method in EpiSafe uh, and, and make it available to users. And then safe technology was what was acquired by DS later on. So now DS offers EpiSafe uh, to you know DS users, and EpiSafe has this Verity module uh, in it. So uh, uh, Verity is also the first commercially available structural stress method for fatigue of welded welded joints, and it still continues to remain the only commercial available method with the original uh, you know Battelle uh, structural stress uh, method. What uh, you know, there are other uh, structural stress based uh, methods uh, uh, available in the market. So this is not something new. We did not, you know, um, uh, invent the structural stress method. There are other methods uh, available. But what makes FECF different is the fact that um, uh, Battelle uh, worked on this project with uh, uh, a joint industry project with several leading engineering companies. And because of that, it was able to test about 300 3,500 uh, welded test connections. So this variety method is very uh, thoroughly validated uh, in terms of actual, you know, geometry, uh, geometry experiment tests. So this this extensive validation uh, uh, is what you know sets apart variety from from other seemingly similar methods. Uh, so this can be applied to, uh, in addition to the other benefits, this this can be applied to structural welds, seam welds, uh, spot welds, and soldier joints. For all the thickness of sheet and plate. So these were the things that we wished uh, to have after looking at the other uh, methods. So now uh, this can handle all thicknesses uh, and all types of wells, uh, 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 you know, when we use Verity. So EFISAFE includes the British standard analysis as standard. Um, uh, and, you know, if you have uh, um, other, uh, you have uh, your material data. So uh, with EFISAFE, as Ashwini mentioned earlier, we provide a lot of um, uh, fatigue material uh, data. But if you want to incorporate resin curves for you know some some new materials that you have tested in your lab, that those can be um, added to. So then the next question comes in uh, uh, that comes in is what stress to you? So if we let's see. So uh, you know the actual stress state of a joint. We were looking at this T-joint example earlier. Can be you know decomposed into structural stress. Uh, and not stress, and what we, uh, you know, focus on in Verity is uh, the structural stress. So structural stress at any given lo location can essentially, you know, uh, uh, come from uh, the summation of your membrane stress and the and, and the bending stress. So in uh, in Verity, the way it works is that dark black line is essentially representing your your, your weld. So um, Verity starts by uh, you know defining the local coordinate system at the weld, and that coordinate system is transformed along the weld line at every node. And three nodes, adjacent nodes, are used to calculate uh, you know the local forces on the nodes, um, represented in this figure by x no x dash and y dash. And those local components are used to calculate your uh, you know uh, bending uh, 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 stress and, and membrane stress, and those are essentially added to give you your structural stress and and the the structural stress is what uh, Verity uh, uses for its calculations. Now, in addition to that, we looked at this example of uh, 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 hotspot stresses earlier on, and we saw you know uh, the amount of scatter that that method can uh, can uh, give in. Now, for the same example uh, of uh, of that plate with that uh, uh, well in the middle. If we look at how mesh insensitive is 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 the uh, the structural stress method really is. So what we're doing here is we're using three mesh refinements. So we have a normal mesh, uh, a coarse mesh, and a fine mesh. And if, when we plot the normal uh, normalized structural stress uh, uh, with the distance along the weld, that distance being the distance you know that weld going around, uh, you know, uh, uh, starting at that section uh, um, AA and going around the weld line. So we see that you know when we use the structural stress as the basis of the calculations, we see a very you know uh, consistent. Uh, uh, I mean, the, we we find that the results are consistent. So for different kinds of elements, 
the, some of those elements uh, in the top plot on the, on the right are you know 20, uh, 20 node reduced uh, integration elements, some of them are 8 node uh, fully integrated elements and for all these different elements and different mesh sizes, you know those uh, the plot of normalized structural stress is essentially the same. So that shows you that the method is uh, insensitive to uh, the size of the mesh, to the type of the element, to the formulation of the element and even solver. Um, and you know another aspect of uh, uh, verity in FECF is, is that it uh, uses nodal, uh, 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 nodal force-based uh, 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 stress as opposed to stress-based results and that gives you know uh, further uh, uh, consistency when you're looking at normalized structural stress. So we, we, we pick the four forces at the, at the nodal locations. Now, you know, the next question comes up, uh, that comes up is what, which SN curve to use? So, uh, these are some of the uh, joints that were tested by uh, Battelle. Uh, and then for, for, for this, we plotted the nominal stress versus life, and then uh, your structural stress versus life, and then your equal in structural uh, stress uh, versus life. So, um, we, can, we can see here that we look at the plot for nominal stress versus life, we see quite a scatter. For these different kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, joints with steel wells, but if we go from normal stress to structural stress, we see that these for these different kinds of joints, you know, with different thicknesses and different kinds of wells, when we switch from normal stresses to structural stress that I you know briefly talked about in the previous slides, the the points now start to line up. Um, um, then you know uh, the question is asked that can we improve the result even further? Um, and if we use the equivalent structural stress, which is what you know, uh, uh, the Verity method use, uh, uses and, and has created it, then we see that all those uh, points line up even further, uh, and that, that is the essentially becomes the master curve for uh, for the uh, for steel wells in this case. So now we have one master SN curve that can be used for all different kinds of wells for different kinds of thicknesses. And uh, you know this equation that we see here for, uh, uh, for when we uh, plot the equivalent structural stress, this takes into account your uh, loading effects, loading mode effects, the effects of thickness of the plate, and um, in the structural stress, uh, 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 when we're using the structural stress, we already uh, remove the sensi sensitivity on the mesh, uh, element type, element formulation, and the solver. So at this point, you know this is taken into account. Uh, 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 the mode of loading, the uh, thickness of the plate, uh, and and makes the uh, method insensitive to uh, mesh solver and element formulation. And and this is what um, you know uh, is finally used uh, in variety. So just to you know just to give us a, a general idea, uh, 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 you know how, how does a typical lap well join uh, look like? Uh, you know, when, especially in context of designing, uh, in context of analyzing it in in what we said. So here, you know, this just show, shows us a, a, a simple, essentially, uh, schematic of uh, uh, of a well and what are the potential crack planes. So on the um, for the uh, T joint on the top uh, left, we see you know uh, areas where you can have throat failure, fusion fa failure, and uh, root failure into the plane. And you know, for uh, the uh, the well shown in the bottom right, you know, again. Uh, depending on uh, what kind of a uh, well you have, is the well participating in the transfer of forces? You know, you can have a prominence of one uh, uh, failure uh, failure plane um, over the other. So, if you want to consider, you know, these kinds of failure planes in in Verity, you essentially have to model uh, those uh, those uh, uh, crack planes for, for for it to take into account uh, for the analysis. So. If we are looking at the well definition for a toe failure, as shown in the figure on the top right, uh, in order to define that toe failure, you would this is this slide just shows the simple setup that needs to be put in for where it is to recognize that toe failure. So in this case, uh, we uh, the user just needs to define uh, an element set uh, shown in pink. That's a through thickness element set. So that defines uh, the fact that you know you are expecting a toe failure here. Uh, and Verity will tell you, you know, what is the life of that uh, toe failure. The red elements uh, represent your weld uh, fillet, 
Uh, and then in addition to defining your uh, element set, uh, the other thing that the user needs to do is to define an element set, sorry, a start element and a start node. That is essentially telling Verity, okay, this is where the well uh, uh, starts. And the, uh, the, uh, the one, one more thing that you need to specify is the reference normal. So in this case, since the toe failure is going into the plate, you define the uh, reference normal uh, in the opposite direction of, of where you crack, uh, you know, you expect your crack to be. In this case, since we expect the crack to go into the plate, the reference normal is just pointing upward. So for the, uh, for the coordinate system shown on the bottom right, we have a 0, 1, 0. So essentially that's saying that the reference normal is, is pointing up to the crack goes down into the uh, plate. Another, you know, just example to give us a feel of what uh, modeling um, uh, a weld in Verity looks like. So if you want to uh, capture a throat weld, uh, again, we'll have to define uh, a, an element set that captures the location of that uh, throat weld. Uh, uh, and then similar to the previous case, we define the start uh, um, element and the start node uh, and the weld line direction. And the weld line direction is again uh, specified by, uh, by specifying the reference norms. In this case, since the weld goes into the uh, uh, throat of the weld, you specify a reference normal that is pointing outwards. So for the coordinate system shown on the bottom right, you specify uh, uh, one uh, uh, unit uh, in both X and Y to give you, uh, you know, an inclined uh, reference normal. What, uh, what makes uh, the user's job easier is the fact that, uh, you know, for both shell and solid uh, elements, uh, starting FPCF 2016, we have the automatic uh, weld finder. So in this case, everything that I talked about in the previous two slides that the user has to specify, now, if the, you know, if you use the automatic weld finder, you only need to uh, identify your element set, uh, the, the set of elements that represent uh, the, the, the weld nugget, and then the rest of the things are, are done by, uh, by uh, automatically by a PC. So it will, it will uh, you know, uh, pick your start node and start element, um, uh, and then, you know, go, go to the two directions till the, till the end of, of the weld. So, you know, it will, it will do that, remove that manual work and make the process uh, uh, a bit uh, more uh, efficient. Here are just, uh, you know, um, uh, different examples to show that um, essentially what it highlights is that uh, Verity uh, can work for different elements. So on the left, we see shell elements, the same thing model using solid hexahedral elements and the same thing using model using solid tetrahedral elements. Hexahedral elements generally give us, you know, uh, higher accuracy. Uh, but essentially, we can capture, you know, uh, uh, all different kinds of elements. And this also shows uh, the insensitivity to the type of element that you're using. And on the bottom, we are just looking at a, at a view, uh, uh, you know, along the axis of that 2 by uh, 6 tube um, that captures that uh, weld shown uh, in red in the top figures. And if we look at uh, the results for these, we see, you know, that the results along uh, the length of the weld, uh, uh, you know, are more or less the same. Uh, and um, tetrahedral tend to be, you know, less, slightly less accurate than hexahedral. So that's what we see here, essentially. But uh, other than that, they more or less uh, overlap. Uh, hexahedral generally being, you know, uh, uh, more accurate. So I believe, yeah, with that, that was just a quick overview because, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, welded, uh, welded, um, you know, any component that has a weld in it, as far as fatigue is concerned, you know, you, you tend to focus on the welds because of the residual stresses that are going on there. And especially in the oil and gas industry with, with pipes and pressure vessels and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, welding uh, being done, this is an important aspect. And, and we're seeing, you know, uh, this increased awareness now where we have a you know, greater demand for uh, uh, fatigue of welded joints. So pe people are slowly moving away from uh, 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 the traditional uh, ways of doing things using SN curves to FP safe and then you know uh, uh, using Verity FP safe so of fatigue. So yeah, if you if you see any application of that in your work and uh, need more information on on that, please feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to you know work uh, work with you or provide more case studies or benchmarks and whatnot. Um, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, was uh, uh, that tomorrow we, uh, the Simulia, uh, the South System Simulia is organizing their regional user meeting. I mentioned that to the couple of gentlemen we have here in the room. So uh, we are organizing a regional user meeting uh, for the South region tomorrow. Uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, 
very close to the VS uh, uh, office here at the Bindal um, Energy Corridor. And uh, if if you, if you if you're not already planning to come, I would encourage you to come. I'd be happy to see you. It's a day long event uh, tomorrow. Uh, free registration, and you'll have uh, uh, you know all um, you know many of our users in this area who use our products, and they'll be you know presenting the, their work, how they use. Abacus, FeSafe, uh, uh, you know, Tosca, Eyesight uh, in their in their work, so you might be able to get an idea of you know how your peers in the industry are are using our our products, and we'll also have um, uh, multiple talks from uh, senior executives. And uh, uh, if you're interested to learn about all the new enhancements we've made in Abacus 2019, so that will that will be there. We'll be uh, you know essentially releasing. Uh, all all the new enhancements that we made in Abacus 2019, which is which hasn't released yet, so we'll be talking about all of that, and then we'll have a networking session uh, five to seven after the conference. So if you have time, uh, if you even if you cannot come for the entire day, we'll be happy to see you even for for a small window if that's possible. So yeah, we hope to see you tomorrow. And if you have any questions, let us know. Okay, thanks, Mr. So so any questions? Uh, I had a question about uh, XFEM. Okay. Uh, is that, I'm not very familiar with it, is that built in to Abacus? Yeah. Is yeah, it? extended finite element method is built in uh, Abacus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, into, into what, in CAE standard? It, it is built in, in CAE yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, and uh, along the same lines, um, do you guys have any, uh, well, I don't think there's any use for FeSafe in fracture mechanics. Or a, a, I suppose any utility. FPC in traction mechanics. What does that mean? Um, if it, perhaps if you can do some sort of fatigue screening that leads into uh, an implicit traction mechanics assessment, or if, you, if there's just sort of any utility at all. So what people tend to use uh, is first of all they use FPC for the crack initiation. And once they see where the location is, then if they are interested, then they can do crack propagation in finite elements. But uh, if you are interested in basically the crack initiation, that that's why uh, we have episode to do that. It, it could, we, it should be able to at least help you determine the direction of the propagation, correct? So, direction of the propagation can be determined in episode. Yes. Yeah. So, FS, but FSA provides you with the crack initiation mm -hmm. and also the location, because as I mentioned about the critical plane searching. Yeah, yeah, so, so with the critical plane searching, you can basically you know the right. angle where exactly. the crack is propagated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's something that's sometimes a little bit requires you to use the engineering judgment. To, yeah. You no. Know, but to consider uh, multiple. But with FSA, you will exactly know it on which plane. Right. The yeah. And that you can then use in in Abacus right. and then put sure. the crack in that particular mm -hmm. okay. And with extern that you mentioned, you you also notice that we we we, we continue well, the Simulia R and D is continuously working on XM and every release you'll see a lot more progress in XM. So that's a that's a field that R and D is investing a lot in. In fact, in the in the in the latest release, we now also have the ability to uh, capture uh, splitting cracks and merging of cracks. So that's that's very brand new. So earlier, yeah, we, but that is just available in two D. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you'll see every release, you'll see that field growing and growing. So it's a field of interest, uh, and that we are continuously. Is there is there something you suggest to get familiar with XFPM? Is there built into sort of sugar? There's a tutorial there, okay. yeah. And sorry. also, I would recommend like if you are interested, then take our fracture mechanics class. The whole they are three to four days we invest Good on yeah. fracture mechanics and uh, using XPEN. And also, there will be like a lot of tutorials which you will be doing in the class gotcha. with XPEN. Yeah. So yeah, that that definitely is the most user friendly way. But uh, I don't know how often you get a chance to look at the documentation. The Abacus documentation is really good. Yeah, yeah. Good. But uh, but yeah, yeah, the thing is, right? Uh, documentation is always available. If there's an instructor, that's the more fun way of learning things. If you take a class. Right. But you know, if you're waiting for it to be scheduled, in the meantime, 
um, you'll find good information in the mm -hmm. documentation and example files and models. So you might you can you might just download an input file, run it, and and you know just see and read its discussion what's going on in the area and then modify that maybe to match what what you need. So that's always a good point you know to want to start learning. In um, obviously nothing beats taking that training class. Okay, that's so it for me. They might have questions. Okay, sure. So the people who are online, any questions? Uh, I see that I read on the Q and A, so maybe so at the top. Which one? At the top, right at the top. See the Q and A button. It's mute, remote. This is four twenty-five. Four twenty-five is mute. No, I think we are not mute. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. So Kaniz, uh, do you know if there are any questions? Yeah, yes, we can. Is mute removed from this? Too much. Okay. Okay, so allow to talk. So, Karparan, now you are allowed to talk. So, so the people who are online now, I think all of you can talk if you unmute yourselves. Okay, Vincent. Still on oh really? Mm. No. Uh, can they maybe type in your question? Yeah, if you want, you can type in your question. Yep. Can you click on that hand that is next? No. Yeah, we don't use Zoom much. The, uh, yeah. I'm never using Okay, so I can send this presentation to to VS and they can they can send it to all the all the people who are available. Yeah. So it is like on slide 45 house craft propagation. Yeah, it is based on fracture mechanics, Karpana. Yeah, we have a inbuilt functionality in uh, FEA uh, in Abacus, which can use a direct cyclic fatigue analysis along with XFEM to, to do that. And it is basically using Paris law to calculate for the, the fatigue graph. For the fatigue graph. Is there any sort of, uh, what gives you input in sort of material properties? Exactly, like there are. <laughs> it's kind of like a struggle having good properties. Yeah, but it, it needs the properties because yeah, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, can't, otherwise can't 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 as good as the property. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Kulkarni, uh, Girish, Vincent. Yeah, Verity method is similar to ASME, but it is not exact version of ASME because uh, in some of this method, they support the uh, the mean stress correction, but uh, efficient Verity doesn't support the mean stress correction. So some of this is missing with ASME.
we used to have a plugin for that. Yeah, but I don't think we, we know. Yeah, we stopped. So and mean stress correction, you know, don't become that important because uh, you know again the residual stresses are so high uh, compared to the mean stress corrections there, and it also uh, the assumption is that the wells are not improved because if you know improvement is performed on the wells, then mean stress correction is likely to become more important. <laughs> okay, so what we can then do, we can provide a quick tutorial. On FSF. So, how many of you have not used FSF at all? Yeah, you okay. get a trial license because um, we're testing out a new set of, or we were testing a new set of uh, license package mm -hmm. recently, but I don't think anyone has gone through it. Okay. And what about the people who are online? Grish, Vincent, Kumaraswamy. So, so is there, uh, so I have you used FSF before? Okay, Karpanan has used before. So what about Grish and Vincent? Okay, so what I can do is let us take and do a 15 minutes brief demo on FSA and then we can break out and you can have a snack. After. Okay, will that be okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in that way, we are not hanging up these online people. <laughs> Okay, so this is how our FSA window looks like. In this, there is this material databases, there is this current FE model, loaded data file, and there's this analysis settings and loading settings. So what is the first step which you will be doing in your FE safe is you will be loading your finite element model. So for loading the finite element model, you will be just going to this uh, window and say open finite element model. And then you can open whatever finite element model you are interested in. So in this particular case. Do you guys have any suggestions to make? To make ODBs friendlier for FSAFE. What do you mean friendlier? Um, maybe you suggest certain uh, output intervals or certain it, outputs to avoid. It depends upon what type of analysis you are doing. If it is a linear analysis, then it doesn't matter. But if it is a non linear analysis, then yes, we ask users to at least output the increment which shows the peaks and valleys okay. yeah. yeah so, so that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. yeah so i am using right now the chef.odb so in this chef.odb uh, i am just pre-scanning that so that it can see how many steps are there in that odb you can see that there are two steps in that odb one is the banding load and another is the torsion load and it has basically two increments one is increment zero and another is the last increment and i'm not interested in the increment zero i'm just increment interested in the last increment and that's what i have used here and then i can say okay now over here you should mention the finite element uh, units. So in this particular case, the stresses is in megapascal, the distance is in millimeter, and force is in meter. So that is this is a very important step in which you have to mention what units you are using on finite elements, and then say okay. So when we import the model. In from finite elements to FSA, it imports all whatever element sets are there in uh, in finite element in ODB or whatever materials or whatever sections are there. All those will come in FSA. Yeah. So right now I want to just use the SA1045, uh, which is the material number as a Group so and say okay. So what happens that this SA1045 will come into the group, which is what I want to analyze, in which whole of this shaft is just 
one material which is SA1045. But there might be that you are analyzing two different materials. Both these materials can be in two separate element groups which you want to analyze here. And each of them you can provide with the different materials. In this particular case, I want to use the material property which is SA1045. In SA1045, you can see that this particular material is using a properties which is Brown Miller with Moro mean stress correction. It is the material class is steel ductile and you can see over here, this is the elastic modulus of this. You can also see the different parameters, which is K prime, N prime, B and C, as well as EF prime and SF prime. All these are the different strain life parameters which we need. In addition to this, we also provide you with the stress life parameters. So you can do either the strain life analysis or the stress life analysis, but by default, it will use a strain life analysis, which is the Brown Miller with Moro mean stress correction. So if I want to just use this particular material for this, just I can choose that material and double click on the material and say yes, then it will use that particular material to this. For the default group, I am saying do not analyze. So I just want to analyze this group, which is SA1045 with the element set name. Yeah, so once I did this, I can then go to the loading settings and in the loading settings. Now I can create the loading. But in this particular case, I want to create the loading is for the bending load. I want to take the stress and I want to add a user defined load set. And in this user defined load set, I'm applying the loading as going from zero to one, which means I am applying this bending load going from zero to 1000 and again going back to zero then 1000 again going back to zero and 1000 yeah so it will have basically the mean stress corrections yeah because and there will be some some mean stress because the loading is going from zero to one so it will have some mean stress uh, i can also apply the scale to it in this particular case i am applying the scale of 2.5 and once I do this, then if I have applied the bending load of 1000 Newton meter, I'm applying the scale of 2.5 such that the load of 2500 Newton has been applied. So, so I can easily scale it because this is my just a linear analysis. Once I do this, I can just run the analysis and say continue. And then it is running the analysis and it will basically give you the results. So it is giving you the results as 330,000 repeats. So if I take this bending load and going from zero to 2,500 Newton, I can do that 330,000 times until I get life of that initiation. Now I can take this particular ODB and I can open basically this model in Episave and I can uh, use basically red most of the time is bad, but in the case of Episave, red is good because higher number is always good. So, what you can do is you can go to options, contours, and you can basically use the reverse way. Yeah. And it will always give you a log life. Review. So uh, if you will use 10 raised to the power 5.574, then it will be exactly this number which you are getting, which is 30, 330. Yeah. So this is like one particular set of loading which you can apply. The another set of loading is like if you have any particular signal, you can open the database and you can take uh, the signal which is coming from. You can take this signal and open this signal in the data file and you can you can basically take those and you can basically do stack plotting. So these are those four signals. What I want to do, I want to take this stress and I want to multiply it with this particular signal. Now, so what I can do, I can clear all the loadings. I can say add a load data set 
So now this stress is coming from the bending is getting multiplied with this particular signal, which is your bending load. Yeah. So now it is now our loading is not just going from zero to one. Now the loading is going such that these stresses are getting multiplied with this particular signal. Yeah. So is that is that where you would implement a histogram? Histogram means uh, uh, it's pretty much uh, essentially just bins of uh, cycles of load. Uh, if histogram you mean by rain flow cycle counting, right? So yeah. because what FECF does, it does the rain flow cycle counting in which if you have a variable amplitude loading, it will calculate how many closed cycles it will form. And it will use those closed cycles to calculate the total damage. Yes. Uh, so, so, so that's what it uh, uses to calculate the fatigue. Yeah. We did not show it on a slide, but that's what it uses internally. Yeah. So now, once we do this, we can just change the ODB file, and then we can run the analysis. And you can see how fast it will be taking those stresses and multiplying it with that whole signal, it has already calculated. And the repeat which it will need is 1.695 repeats. And you can then again copy this and paste it in the ODB and see what, how does the results look like. You can also not only do this, you can also take the another step, which is the torsion step. Yeah, And you can multiply it with the another signal, which is corresponding to the signal. And then you can say add a load data set. Now this block is having two loads, one coming from the bending, another coming from the torsion. And both of these loadings is applied a two different signal. One is from this bending and another is from this torsion. So these two signals are different, which has been applied. Yeah. So once we do this, we can apply the change this ODB name and we can run the analysis. And we can see the results. It is, yeah, because now there are two different steps which are coming and superimposing together. That's why it is taking some time, but that time will be less than a minute. Yeah, it has calculated it and it has given you 16,000 repeats. So now if I look at the results, then this is how the results will look like for this particular ODB. So in this, uh, you can see that the life is not coming minimum here. Life is coming minimum at these locations. And the reason is because we are putting the kinematic coupling applied over here and those kinematic coupling is used to apply the rotation. So that that can cause some sort of stress similarities and because of those stress similarities, there can also be a uh, fatigue life, which can be made. So uh, you have to be very careful with all these different aspects. So what you can do then is you can use a, a view toolbar and you can use the views and you can basically Exactly. Where is my another deck window? Yeah, I think. But if you like, yeah, maybe go to views. I think it's. Oh, that. Yeah, to the left. Oh, that's. Create it's display on, group. No, it's on a different screen that happens with Windows 10. Try, try uh, pressing. Sh <laughs> we can. Okay, now yeah, we can select at least the element. Or yeah, and, say and, and then you turn. Yeah. And where to remove? <laughs> so you can maybe use this. Uh, uh, so, so, so. Replace, remove. remove. Yeah, and then select. Okay. Yeah, that should work. Okay. So now you can see that the minimum life is coming at this location. So, so you need to know basically those are stress similarities. So the life will be minimum at those locations because of the kinematic coupling so that you can remove those effects. So, so this was a very brief overview on what 
efficient and how you can solve this particular problem. But we have a whole two day class which tells about this introduction to FSA and which basically there are like at least seven to eight workshops which you can do, which will give you a pretty good knowledge on what, how you can use FSA as a tool as well as how, what is the theory behind FSA. Okay. Okay, so any, any questions about this particular demo and if you have any other problems which you like us to discuss, then also we, we both are able to take Okay, so the people who are online, uh, I am seeing that they are. Okay. Okay, so it looks like there is no question. So I think like we are we are done with this presentation so the people who are online just just feel please feel free to uh, send us the email to wires and uh, wires will refer it to us if uh, if they have questions for us i think what something the okay in the chat okay so uh, this is a good question karpanan is asking like how to add user defined material so karpanan uh, for adding the user defined material what you can do is you can take any of our material in the database and then say copy material and now you can uh, rename the material as like any karpanan name material. okay user and then for this user, you can then choose your constant amplitude endurance limit. You can use the elastic modulus. You can change the poisons ratio. You can change the ultimate tensile strength. And now it is basically editable. You can change the K prime, N prime, B, C, E, F prime, S, F prime, as well as you can change the S N curve. So you can double click on it and you can basically change your S N curve also. And the way you can change the algorithm, because right now, by default, it will use a strain life curve. You can go to the algorithm and over here, you can use select an algorithm to be used. Use the arrow and instead of strain life curve, you can also choose the stress life curve. Yeah. So you can use stress life with moro and say, okay, now the strain life will not be used, but the stress life curve. Yeah, but if you go to the algorithm, then it will show you that mainly the strain life curve can be used for both high cycle fatigue as well as low cycle fatigue, but the stress life can just be used for the high cycle fatigue. So Karpanan, does it answer your question? Okay, so Vincent, your question is how FSAF handle analysis with multiple state histograms? So can you just explain me, uh, or if, if you know here, what is what do you mean by multiple state histogram? I think like we should be able to do it, but if I know, like I what, think it's just a different terminology that they're using is probably in there. Yeah. We, so yeah, and if you can explain. Uh, I, I, I kind of want him to explain. <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> Vincent, I, I'm not sure like how we can unmute it. Uh, let me check more. Unmute. I think it you are muted from your side, uh, Vincent. If you are if you will unmute yourself, then I think you should be able to talk. Just try to unmute yourself, Vincent. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, so either Vincent, we can talk offline, uh, like next week. What do you mean by multiple state histogram? And then then I'll be able to answer that question. Will that be okay? Okay.
so you can just email me uh, and my email address i am just writing it here so that you can copy and paste and then we can discuss on the email and then you can also call okay so any other questions uh, vincent or karpanan okay so if there are no questions then let us just we are just logging off and yeah let us know if you have any questions in future okay so i think we are done so let me just I think because the stock share button at the top. Okay. Yeah. Mute the mic.